I, just before I start my presentation, I just wanted to ask this question. I've, I've, done, uh, I've done quite a bit of uh, public speaking in the last couple of weeks, and I've asked the same question every time. I just want to know, um, who of you know who this band is? Anybody? No? It's not Simon and Garfunkel. Who said that? <laughs> um, Art Garfunkel had far better hair than that. But... Um, this band over here is the Grateful Dead. Okay, the Grateful Dead, the reason why I, I've, I've, I'm starting this presentation with that, this band is because um, I'm very interested in community, the idea of community and its place within marketing. And at the end of last year, I started doing a lot of research together with my team about community marketing and, and, uh, and who's doing it well, looking for case studies. And these guys, kept on coming up again and again. There's uh, been a lot of uh, marketers over the last couple of years talking about their success and there's even been a book uh, which uses them as quite a profound case study. It's called Radical Marketing. I highly recommend that you guys get it. Um, and they talk about Grateful Dead as this band that's really done it right. Now, the interesting thing about the Grateful Dead I don't know if, I mean, obviously you guys don't know the Grateful Dead very well. I'm a massive fan of music and I'd never really heard of them. I'd heard the name a couple of times. I'd never heard their music until the beginning of this year. I started listening to a little bit of it and I'm not really a massive fan of the music, but I loved their, their style and what they did. The, it just so happens that they are the most successful live band in the history of rock and roll music. They're bigger than the Rolling Stones. The other bands that you may think are, are you know, been really successful in touring. I saw U2, they were fantastic, but they, they've, they're more successful than U2 in terms of, of a live band. They've played over 2,300 shows to approximately 40 million people. They, were, they started in uh, 1965 and they, they disbanded in 1995 when um, uh, this guy, he's the lead singer, uh, Jerry Garcia, um, he happened to be quite an extraordinary guy. He, uh, he, he, he smoked more weed, snorted more cocaine, ingested more hallucinogenics, and did more heroin than any other musician in history, except for maybe Keith Richards. Um, and here's where it gets interesting. They had this fan base, these guys called the Deadheads. Now, the Deadheads kept on coming up in these uh, marketing studies. They were the fans that followed them around on their tours. Now they toured all the time as you, you can imagine and these, <laughs> these awesome guys used to follow them. They basically used to do these package tours where they would watch 10 shows in a row. Now who does that? I mean who would go watch like Jack Parrow 10 times in a row, you know? Your ears would start bleeding and I think the problem is with, with, uh, with most bands is that you go there, you get your fix and you go away. The Deadheads were absolutely loyal to this brand, this cause, these musicians who were so dedicated to music. And that's where I wanna, I wanna talk about. I wanna take out some lessons from the Grateful Dead and what they did right, because it's, there's some really interesting things that we can learn from these guys. Now, I'm the, the CEO of Worldwide Creative. We're a, a digital marketing agency. We're based in Cape Town and Joburg and in London. We've got a number of clients that we, we we offer the, the whole sort of digital marketing sphere of services uh, to our clients. And ultimately, what we want to do with all of our clients, the, the kind of consequence at the end of the day after we do all our, our, our stuff, is to create a community around their brand. Um, and it's becoming, I'm, I'm a big advocate of the idea of community and, uh, and working towards community, purely because of you know, the environment that we find ourselves in. Um, I want to make sure. I want to make it clear that this is not a social media presentation. I'm sure there's a lot of guys going to talk about social media, and I've been to hundreds of social media presentations. So, just you know, throw tomatoes at me if I say things like "join the conversation." Um, <laughs> so, I want to start off just looking at some of the problems that we we're facing at the moment, and there's some profound problems that we've. We as marketers and as brands and as companies and entrepreneurs are facing. And the first is very obvious. You guys have probably heard of the term attention economy. It's basically the fact that your attention has become an asset like any other uh, in a company because there is so much noise. 
This gentleman over here is Eric Schmidt. He's the erstwhile CEO of Google. He was CEO until I think the beginning of this year. I can't re remember exactly. But he said something pretty profound last year. Every two days we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until 2003. Now that is absolutely phenomenal if you think about it. Now 2003 you'll probably know is when social media really started to kick in. It's when Facebook really started to hit its, hit its straps and, uh, and, and you know we started getting all these social media, social network um, portals popping up all over the show. What it means is that there's a hell of a lot of noise that we have to contest with as marketers and as consumers, as, as tar target audience members. So this noise makes it very difficult for us to gain traction in the marketplace. The second problem is that there's a lot of confusion about the, st the state of marketing at the moment. A lot of people are talking about you getting, you know, social media gurus, you're getting marketing gurus, you're getting, I mean, marketers are like the new lawyers nowadays. You know, everybody's a, a guru nowadays. And, and, I mean, this guy, I was very fortunate to meet him, Robert Pillay. He's the CEO of Gucci Global. I met him at the beginning of this year. And he said something very extraordinary in, our, uh, in the, the presentation that he did to, to a small group of entrepreneurs. He said, I have 2 million people on my Facebook page who I can talk to directly. Why do I need traditional advertising? Now, Gucci spend hundreds of millions of dollars every single year on traditional advertising. You know, those big, flashy, glossy ads that you see in Vogue magazine and so on. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it sounds great. It sounds right. It sounds like, you know, Facebook is free, so obviously it's a, it's a viable solution. But it occurred to me afterwards that... There's something wrong with that statement, and if you think about it, it's not sustainable. Because you can have as many fans as you like on Facebook, but that many fans, you, you can't, those, those people, you cannot interact with directly as the brand, because then you're just defaulting back to traditional media, so it'll become one-to-one, -one. and you can't have teams and, and, and you know, rows of social media managers trying to interact to two million people. So there's something wrong about the, the way people are thinking about Facebook um, and these, these, you know, these, uh, these social media portals. The third problem is that everybody's looking for the next big thing. Now, believe me, as the CEO of a digital marketing agency, we get this a lot. We've got a number of clients and we get a lot of people saying to us a lot of the time, you know, I want a, I, I, we've got a bit of budget left, we want a, a, a mix it campaign. Or I want to do something on Facebook. Or I want to do something on Twitter. And, you know, if they hear about, say, something like Quora, which is a, you know, a new social network of sorts, they'll say, let's do something on Quora. And the problem is that, you know, next month there's the next big thing. So, like, augmented reality or, or geolocation, geotargeting, you know, all these things are almost a distraction. You're always looking for the next big thing. And I think this is happening more and more that marketing managers and companies and entrepreneurs are getting somewhat distracted by all these things that are popping up all over the place. The fourth thing, which is for us, it's, it's a bit of a laugh really, but we get this a lot. We get, you know, design me something that's going to pop and fizz, and believe it or not, this is actually true. We had this, uh, we had a marketing manager say to us, we, they want fruit salad. Now, we still don't actually know what that means, but um, the, 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 I don't know how many of you guys have received a, 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 a competition, I mean, we're starting to call it competition spam, where it's click on like and win an iPad. Now, you, you get that all the time, and people are starting to ignore it. The noise is starting to, to phase it out of your, your consciousness. And, and I think, you know, please don't do that. <laughs> please don't <laughs> offer an iPad, because try and be a little bit more creative. Try and think a little bit differently about it, because otherwise you're just going to look the same as everyone else. Um, this, to me, is, is very interesting. I mean, as much as I, you, you've probably seen these kind of graphs before, but it's, it's fascinating to me, just the marked difference in that you look at all the traditional media, radio, newspapers, magazines, TV, you know, there's just been a decline, and then the Internet is just shooting up. And now, I mean, you can put that into context, it's starting from a low base and, and so on, but to me, it's absolutely profoundly amazing that this here is actually starting to it's starting to represent a convergence of the traditional media. If you think about it, you can listen to the radio, you can watch programs, videos, podcasts, all that stuff. All of, all of the above, you can base, or all of the below, you can, you can digest now in this one converged uh, media channel, which is, it's a, it's a problem, but it's also, I think, very exciting. Um, 
so what does this word community mean? I bang the drum quite a lot. And just to kind of get back to, back to basics, the origin of the word comes from the Latin communare, which basically means to share. Now, sharing is really at the heart of community, and if you're going to do this right. And what brands in the past, not just digital brands, but brands throughout the, dec the past couple of decades who've really focused on community, they've understood this concept of what sharing actually means. Um, what we've created at Worldwide Creative is this thing called the, the Community Management Grid. Sorry, it's a little bit out of focus, but essentially in every digital marketing campaign, there's, there's three verticals and three horizontals, if you will. The three horizontals are attract traffic, convert traffic, and retain traffic, so like loyalty. Um, and, and the verticals are content syndication, monitoring engagement, and creative, the creative stimulus in every campaign. And out of this matrix, you can get the different roles and the, the different accountability points. Now, I'm sure you guys will get this, um, this presentation afterwards, and, and you'll probably be able to download it. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But what is happening through all of this is out of this grid, you can create community. If you look at those things, specifically what type of content you publish um, and how you syndicate that, uh, that content. Looking at monitoring engagement, we've, we've got this amazing ability now to hold ourselves accountable. So it's no longer about just pushing our content and moving on to the next thing. We can actually see over the course of a period of time what works and what doesn't. We can also see who's engaging, who's interacting with that type of content. Content is now a catalyst for interaction. And we can see what is going on. So we can start to determine what to do next based on the accountability of the past. And then obviously the creative stimulus, which I think a lot of people get wrong. I think a lot of people just push out content for content stakes, uh, content's sake. But think creatively. Because it's going to make you stand out from all of this clutter, all of this noise that we spoke about earlier. So what is the holy grail of community marketing. Now, this is something that's absolutely fascinating. To me, it's magical. When you see this start to work, it's, it really is quite something extraordinary. And, and I've taken three um, uh, uh, just case studies, I suppose. The first is from um, our good friends at Yuppie Chef. Um, I don't know, who's, who's been to Yuppie Chef, the website? Does anyone know? It? Okay, quite a few of you. Now, um, I don't know who, who's a fan of Facebook, but they've got quite a cool Facebook page where you know, um, Marina, their, uh, their community manager, will just post a little question, uh, you know, at the beginning of the day, something like, you know, what, how do you like your fish done? And bang, al almost immediately, the string of comments, people start to talk to each other in the community about, about you know, how fish should be done, and they start debating and fighting and talking about it and discussing it. And Marina's just spent five minutes pushing out a question, and the community is starting to do the work. So Robert Pillay's problem earlier where, you know, it's like he can now talk to 2 million people directly, that is, you know, we can, we can go past that by letting the community work amongst themselves. The second one is Mark Keohan's blog. I don't know if you, anyone of, of you is a big rugby fan. I'm a massive rugby fan. But um, keo.co.za is I think it's the biggest rugby blog in the world, according to their advertising guy who keeps knocking on our door. But um, the, the, the thing about them is they'll publish, say, two or three articles in a day. And throughout the entire day, there's so much activity based on what the content that they push out, which may be two or three paragraphs about something that's happened in the World Cup or in the, the game on, on Saturday. And all of a sudden, the community is starting to share with each other. They're starting to... It's actually quite funny to watch, if you watch the community and the string of comments, that, you know, a, a, um, a, an article about which, uh, you know, what the, the front row of the Springbok side should look like um, starts to get distracted to, you know, where's a good briar place in Craddock to go to, you know? And these guys start to know each other. They start to talk to each other as if they're, like, familiar with each other. And it's absolutely brilliant. They have thousands of comments on some totally arbitrary little piece of content. Um, and, and that, to me, is, is publishing magic. And then this is, again, extraordinary. Two decades after Jerry Garcia died, the lead singer of, uh, and the lead guitarist of uh, The Grateful Dead, they still have 800,000 people on their Facebook page talking about 
the, the band and the shows and the, you know, throughout the ages, all the various um, flashpoints within Grateful Dead's career. And every day, somebody publishes something, somebody push out, uh, pushes out a comment. I mean, this one has, you know, it's some arbitrary thing about um, a guitarist, and three and a half thousand people like it. They got 425 comments. I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible for a band that it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and that's the power of community. So I just want to talk about two publishing case studies, and then I'm going to talk about some lessons we can learn from the Grateful Dead, and then uh, I'll open it up to questions. The first is Spatula. I've spoken about um, uh, uh, Yappy Chef already. Now, these, these guys are good friends of ours. We, we all kind of started in the same living room, Worldwide Creative and, and Heavy Chef and Yappy Chef. It's a bit confusing, I know. They stole the name from me, but um, <laughs> Spatula Magazine is there. It's a WordPress blog. Basically, uh, you know, I actually spoke to Andrew uh, just, uh, uh, just yesterday about why they do this magazine. Yappy Chef is an e-commerce site. It's an extraordinarily ex successful uh, e-commerce site. It's a real um, South African entrepreneur uh, story. But everybody talks about the, the e-commerce platform. But this is sitting in the sidelines, and it's starting to gather momentum. It's not the best site in the world. Andrew admits it. But um, what it is, basically, is their secret strategy to, to build community. The idea behind Yappy Chef is not just about retail. It's not just about pushing products. It's about engaging a community. The entire focus of their marketing plan is to use publishing, taking content to catalyze people within the community to start talking to each other. It's a way of endearing themselves. There's so many benefits to this. And they haven't got it right yet. I mean, you know, this is a, it's a plain WordPress site. They built it about a year and a half ago. But they've got big plans for it. At the moment, I think it's a Woo Themes WordPress, um, WordPress theme. And, you know, they've appropriated. It looks pretty cool. The content is, I think, very good. They talk about stuff, how to cook the best pizza, um, you know, all these various little competitions. They do things like Yappy Chef's uh, fifth birthday celebration. So there's so many benefits to that. They're communicating that... It's not just a computer, you know, or a, a, like a, a bland website. There's actual real people behind, behind this brand, this, this, uh, this e-commerce site. And, and it's breaking down the perceptions of, of what online business is, is all about. And so for me, this is a, it's a massive part of their, their, I think, their future success that they're going to have. As they, I mean, they've just employed um, a traditional editor to come on board and help them with their content, spending a lot of money on it. And they're pushing a lot of, um, a lot of their time and, and weight and, and resources and money behind this portal, purely because they believe in the idea of community. Now, we've done the same with the Heavy Chef. I don't know, who, has anyone been to a Heavy Chef um, session? Okay, quite a few of you. Um, the Heavy Chef is Worldwide Creative's kind of like a sleeping strategy. In the same way as we just, you know, we're, we're an agency and we do what agencies do. So we do strategy, development, the ongoing marketing, pay-per-click, you know, all these things that I think, you know, a lot of people, except for maybe the social media side, which we do, you know, a lot of this stuff is not very exciting to people. Now, this suddenly brings it alive. For us, it brings us into the sphere. It's a big part of our strategy. The sessions, the events that we hold at the Heavy Chef are, are really important to us because it puts us in the public eye. We invite uh, speakers from around the world, and then we video them, and we put them on, on, our, um, on this blog, which is is generating a hell of a lot of traffic. It's essentially just a, a WordPress site, again, that we're using to publish content, the stuff that we know, and endear ourselves with, well, our community. So this is our, um, our sort of attempt at building community. So what marketing lessons can we learn from these drag-addled uh, hooligans that we, we've seen, uh, you know, disband a decade and a half ago? And, and and basically existed for three decades to phenomenal success. And the first and the most important lesson is any community is defined by a cause. And this is something that we've learned the hard way. If you push out and you try any kind of marketing uh, uh, strategy that, that aims to build community, if you do not have a viable cause that people can fight for, that there's a visceral reaction to, an evocative response within, you will not succeed. It will not be sustainable. You may be able to get a lot of uh, people to join, but that's via the incentive of what you can get out of it. They will leave shortly afterwards. They won't stick around. They certainly won't talk to other people, which, again, is the holy grail of, of, of community. 
So have a cause, figure it out. It's a lot more difficult than you may imagine. Some brands, you know, it really is difficult because the nature of their business is not really something that you want to fight for. You know, it could be selling widgets or, you know, I don't know, you know, cattle fertilizer or something. You know, how do you create a cause around something like that? For a band like the Grateful Dead, you know, their cause was the love of music, the sheer love of playing in front of people and really sticking to that and honoring that. So you've got to figure it out. You either look within your company, and, you know, and, and there, there may be something very obvious, or you go outside and you look at something like the environment or, you know, what do you want to fight for? And that's the way you build community. Um, the second, give content away freely. Now, social media is all about free stuff, if you think about it. Um, I'm actually surprised this, this uh, conference wasn't free. But, you know, the, 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 the Grateful Dead, um, what they did that no other band did in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, they, they gave away their music for free. They encouraged bootleggers to basically <coughs> record their concerts and, and share and syndicate their content um, you know, these, these recordings are everywhere nowadays. If you go to all the, the Grateful Dead forums, you'll see the recordings and you can buy, you know, um, bootleg copies of some uh, concert somewhere in the 70s. And people just go crazy for the stuff still to this day. The third is create unique idiosyncrasies. Now, you'll see this in any kind of active community, that they create language of their own. Uh, Mark Hohen's blog, for some other reason, I don't even know what it means, but every time the first, the first guy who comments on any article on, on a rugby you know, post, he'll say dragons. I don't know why, but that's a unique idiosyncrasy that's, that's you know, owned by that community. These bears, by the way, the Grateful Dead, there's a fascinating story behind it in that their drummer, in some acid-induced frenzy, um, started painting these things all over the place. And the band members kind of dug it, so they started using it on their sleeve notes and their liner notes and all that kind of thing. And now, you know, to this day, these bears are everywhere. They are on all the merchandise and T-shirts and all the stuff around the Grateful Dead that you can buy. Can you want to tell me who this guy is? It's Barack Obama. Yeah, I didn't recognize him at first, but that's Barack, a younger Barack. Now, he is publicly admitted to smoking weed. Here's a photograph of him smoking a spliff. So... It so happens that Barack Obama, the leader of the free world, is a huge Grateful Dead fan. So much so that he actually invited the remaining members of the Grateful Dead to reform and play at his inauguration when he won um, the presidential election. Now, the thing about the Grateful Dead, what they had was they had these hugely influential guys, lawyers and doctors and whoever it was, you know, he would just love to kind of dress down and go to a Grateful Dead concert, you know, do whatever they do, and then come back and live their life again. So they had all these guys who were really pushing the cause of the Grateful Dead. Now, we know this from the campaigns that we ran at Worldwide Creative, that if you can get to those influencers, those brand ambassadors, the advocates, they provide you with an amazing conduit to a much bigger community. And it's far more sustainable than trying to get to everybody at once. Um, empower members. Now, this is obviously very important in a social media context, publishing content, you've got to be able to empower them. So let them share on Twitter. Let them, uh, you know, talk about it on Facebook. Use all the tools at your, disp at your disposal to allow whatever content you publish to be able to be syndicated as far and wide as possible. The Grateful Dead do this very well. Um, if you're interested, go to the, the official website and see how they've used the tools to let people, you know, organize their own get-togethers and, and share memorabilia and so on. Um, interact relentlessly. This is something that's it's, it's the, it's unfortunate how difficult this is. Community building is not hard. It's, it's very hard because of this, um, this very fact. You cannot escape from the idea of relentless interaction with your, your audience. And this is why we actually don't do social media management uh, at, our, at our agency because it's just too hard. It's not sustainable for us to have rows of, of you know, social media people trying to act on behalf of the brands that we represent because it's just, first of all, it's not authentic. And secondly, you cannot interact relentlessly. I don't know who follows um, a Virgin Active on, uh, on Twitter. Anybody? Now, G Giovanni, the guy who's the sort of official you know, social media guy for Virgin Active, he's phenomenal. I've been in a meeting with Gio, and it's actually quite disturbing because the guy's always his head down, and he's, 
You know, he's, he's, he's like on his phone all the time, responding to people. He's so fanatical about the brand. And that's something you can't get away from. You have to interact relentlessly. There are guys like Gio, absolutely amazing at it. Um, but what you've got to do is figure out how you can do this well. Because if you don't, it's, you know, it's not going to be as powerful. I mean, the, the Grateful Dead did it by just touring relentlessly throughout the, the decades that they were in existence. Rewards often. Look at how you can reward your members. I mean, that's, I think, self-explanatory. Self so just to close off, is community building really that important? And, you know, I mean, I've had this debate with people, you know, talking about maybe getting distracted by trying to build communities when there's other things that are more important, like trying to attract as many people as possible. Now, in my opinion, this is the most important thing that you can do in this day and age. Community is so vital to the sustainability of your brand because of the fact that it's only going to get more and more noisy as we go on. So you have to ring fence people into your community. And if we look at what the Grateful Dead is, now this is a decade and a half after they, you know, they disbanded, that Jerry Garcia, their talisman, died. They have 800,000 fans on Facebook. This was actually, I think, a couple of months ago, so maybe a lot more. They still do $60 million in merchandise every year for a band that none of you have, have ever heard of. Now, that's a phenomenal amount of money. They've got that, that bear that, um, that the guy painted. Now, that's been created into this little fluffy toy. <laughs> that is now the second highest selling little fluffy toy in America after, you know, the beanie, beanie baby or whatever that, that is. Um, and according to McKinsey, which is a research company, that customers who, are, who have opted into a community are nine times more likely to buy your product than, than any other, any, any competing product. So basically, it's hell of important to think about community. So whatever you publish, whatever content you create, think about it in the context of community. And that's it from me.